Uh, my name's George Perkovich. I'm a vice president for studies here at the Carnegie Endowment. And it's my great pleasure to welcome uh, all of you and to be able to introduce uh, our esteemed speakers today. Um, the topic is the future of arms control. Um, we are, I guess, say, honored to have uh, speaking uh, to us and with us in conversation today, uh, President Mary Robert Robinson, who's the chair of the elders, about which I'll say uh, a little bit more. Um, she, as everyone knows, was the first was the president of Ireland from 1990 to 1997, former High Commissioner of the UN for Human Rights, uh, and was an envoy of the UN for climate change from 2014 and 2015. There's a longer list of her uh, great accomplishments in public service. She uh, is uh, an, an initial uh, member of the elders since it was founded in 2007. Uh, similarly, uh, Dr. Gro Brundtland, uh, former prime minister of Norway, uh, also has been with the elders from the beginning in 2007. Uh, in addition to being Prime Minister of Norway, she served, of course, as the Director General of the World Health Organization from, 2000 and, uh, from 1998 to 2003, and she, too, was a UN Special Envoy for Climate Change, uh, a, a position that probably will remain for decades, I, I suppose. Um, they have been part of an elders group that's produced the report they're going to talk about uh, here today on the future of arms control and a proposal especially for nuclear minimization, which they will, uh, they will detail. The elders was the uh, inspiration of Nelson Mandela. Uh, it was only founded in 2007, and it, and it, as the name suggests, was animated by the idea that as I get older, I think is ever wiser, although probably less popular, which is that people who have great experience uh, and have wrestled for a long time with the world's most difficult uh, problems might have some insights uh, as to what is required to solve some of these most difficult uh, problems, and that others might benefit by listening uh, from, uh, to, their, to their insights. Not in the era of social media the way it usually goes, I think everybody wants to project from youth uh, upward. But uh, I think the idea behind it uh, remains quite powerful. And I think we'll hear uh, reasons why uh, when uh, President Robinson and Prime Minister Brunlin give their remarks. And so I'm going to get out of the way and welcome them to do that. Uh, we'll have a little bit of a conversation, and then we'll open it to a broader, uh, broader conversation. President Robinson. Good afternoon, and thank you very much, George. And thank you to all at the Carnegie Endowment uh, for International Peace for arranging this lunch event, and also giving both Gru Brundtland and myself the opportunity to speak to you and then um, on the future of arms control. And then I hope we can have a thoughtful uh, discussion. I was reminded when you were outlining um, the description of the elders that uh, I now find that my husband, who has a good sense of humor, says, well, Mary's the elder. I'm just elderly. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, that's the. Uh, it's fitting that uh, we're, tr we're meeting to discuss the future of nuclear arms control on this very day, the International Day for the Total Elimination of Nuclear Weapons, an occasion on which we should all focus our minds on the threat posed by nuclear weapons. I know there are a lot of distractions at the moment here in Washington, but I'm glad that in this group we can have that focus. And let's take a moment to do just that. When the first atomic bomb exploded over Hiroshima on August the 6th, 1945, it made no distinction between civilians and combatants. Virtually all those within half a kilometer of the blast were instantly incinerated, boiled or crushed to death. Those who weren't immediately slaughtered died terrible deaths soon after from burns, wounds, and later radioactive sickness. Altogether, the bombs detonated over Hiroshima and three days after over Nagas Nagasaki uh, claimed hundreds of thousands of lives. 
So as we talk of deterrence and doctrine and non-proliferation, it's only right that we remind ourselves that there is a humanitarian and a moral bottom line behind those words, one of terrible, indiscriminate human suffering. The threat posed by nuclear weapons is one of the two great existential threats facing humanity today, the other being, of course, the climate emergency. The world is now closer to a nuclear catastrophe than at any time since the height of the Cold War. However, the seriousness of the threat, the scale and horror of a potential catastrophe, and discussion on what can be done to de-escalate the risk have been given, in our opinion, a shockingly low amount of consideration by political decision makers, by opinion formers, and by the public. This lack of attention allows failures to, present agree to preserve agreements and build consensus on non-proliferation to go broadly unnoticed. There's an unraveling going on, and it's largely unnoticed and unchallenged. We've seen the termination of the INF, the collapse of the JCPOA, and real concerns over the future of New START, CTBC, BT, and even the non-proliferation treaty. Set against this lack of concern for the risk and apparent absence of political will to support the existing safeguards, the elders have developed a set of proposals that we believe could significantly contribute to increasing a global security and reducing the threat of, um, natural, of, of nuclear catastrophe. Uh, my fellow elder, Gru Brundtland, will speak further about the details of what we propose, but I'll take a short while to elaborate to our con on our concerns about the state of nuclear arms control. We believe that the recent breakdown of much of the arms control architecture and increasing uncertainty over remaining agreements risks fueling a new nuclear arms race and increases the risk of accidental nuclear conflict. The breakdown of the INF Treaty presents one such risk. Its termination in August removed all limitations on the ability of the US and Russia to develop intermediate range land-based missiles. This is an immediate concern not only for Europe, which may, only, may once more be within range of Russian intermediate range missiles, but also in Asia. We believe it would be very dangerous for the US to use the end of the INF Treaty to deploy intermediate range missiles in Asia, which could risk fueling an arms race involving China, India, and Pakistan in the worst case scenarios. There's an urgent need for good faith diplomatic efforts between the US and Russia to limit the fallout from the termination of the INF Treaty, including through exploring whether alternative agreements could be reached that might preserve some or, or all of the benefits derived under that treaty. Looking to the future, we see significant risk in the uncertainty around the prospects for the extension of New START. It would send a deeply negative message to the world if this crucial bilateral agreement between the US and Russia were allowed to expire in February 2021. After all, it's the sole surviving agreement between the two major nuclear states, and its collapse would not only eliminate the only remaining constraint on their nuclear arsenals, but would also remove the monitoring and inspection capabilities, which have provided both countries with unprecedented transparency over each other's stockpiles. As we understand it, the position of the Trump administration is to seek to bring China into an expanded version of New START. We agree with the general principle that bringing China into discussions on arms control is a good thing, and meaningful dialogue should be, brought, or should be sought on issues such as transparency of nuclear stockpiles. But China's nuclear warhead count is only one twentieth or so of the size of the US and Russian stockpile, and virtually none of these are actively deployed. It would therefore be nonsensical to try to integrate China into New START or any agreement remotely resembling it, and it would be foolish to make New START extension contingent on China's participation. Therefore, given the very limited time before the scheduled expiry of the New START in February 2021, we would urge the United States government to begin serious negotiations with Russia and seek to extend the treaty for a further five years. 
Whilst the stalling New START process represents a failure of crucial bilateral negotiations, we're also concerned to see the absence of progress on key multilateral agreements too. We note with alarm, for instance, reports that the Trump administration is considering revoking the US signature to the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. Although the CTBT has yet to enter into force, it has already contributed significantly to the establishment of global norms against the testing of nuclear weapons, with the support of over 300 international facilities to detect and monitor nuclear detonations. Revoking the US signature to this treaty would send a worrying signal to the rest of the world that nuclear test testing may no longer be an unconditionally illegal act and would undermine an essential tool for the monitoring of nuclear activity in DPK, DPRK and elsewhere in the world. The termination of the INF Treaty, the potential expiry of New START, and the uncertain future of the CTBT put the world on, we believe, a perilous trajectory of mistrust and miscalculation. This path reaches a significant fork in the road in April 2020, when the world, as you know, will meet to review the Non-Proliferation Treaty. Ratified by all of the permanent members of the Security Council, in addition to almost all UN member states, this is the cornerstone of the global non-proliferation and disarmament regime. Failure to negotiate and re-energize them at this juncture would put at risk the near universal global commitment to non-proliferation and push um, uh, some countries to seek their own nuclear weapons programs. Alternatively, Seizing this moment to demonstrate continued commitment to disarmament could be the turning point to the other, in the other direction. So the elders call on the United States and all other nuclear states to take this opportunity to demonstrate renewed and unwavering support for both non-proliferation and disarmament, which they're, of course, legally obliged to do under the uh, NPT. Next year, as you know, <coughs> marks the 75th anniversary of the end of the Second World War and of the birth of the nuclear age, founded in misery and unprecedented destructive power at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. It will be a year full of significance for those who care about our world's ability to work together and who wish to overcome the divisions that have sadly become increasingly dominant in international political discourse. So we hope as elders that we can seize that moment to rejoin the, part, the, the paths together and ensure our world never witnesses such nuclear atrocities again. We are at a dangerous moment. We need to alert people. We need more discussion of this. And I'm delighted we're going to have it today. So thank you very much for um, this opportunity. And I hope we can have a very stimulating discussion. And I now hand over to my colleague and friend, Gul. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, we are glad to be here and uh, to be able to have this kind of discussion at this difficult time. As Mary just has said, uh, of course, we see the nuclear threat as elders as uh, one of the biggest threats to the future, together with climate change. Now, let us, um, uh, you know, as we have, we ha Mary has already said, uh, the international arms control architecture is at risk of collapsing, and a new nuclear arms race between the US and Russia may well have begun. The stakes could not be much higher. Let us briefly consider the scale of the risk we face. There are 14,000 nuclear warheads in existence today, with a combined destructive capability of nearly 100,000 Hiroshima-sized bombs. Over 90% of these are in the hands of the US and Russia. Worryingly, almost 4,000 remain operationally deployed, and most disturbing of all, 2,000 are currently held on high alert status. That's 2,000 nuclear warheads ready to be launched within a few minutes in the event of a perceived attack. Our view is simple. As long as nuclear weapons remain in existence, 
it is inevitable that they will someday be used, whether by design, accident, or miscalculation. The only guarantee of the non-use of nuclear weapons is their complete abolition. Unfortunately, that is where the simplicity ends. The difficulty in crafting a fully enforceable global zeroes treaty means it is not politically realistic to expect the elimination of nuclear weapons anytime soon. That is why we believe that nuclear disarmament is most likely to be achieved through a practical step-by-step -step process which can secure buy-in from all governments, including the nuclear powers and their allies. We therefore advocate that the immediate medium term objective should be to focus on minimization of nuclear weapons, but with total nuclear disarmament as the ultimate end goal. This is why the elders are proposing a minimization agenda that calls on all nuclear powers to take urgent first steps towards nuclear disarmament. This is made up of four key asks, our four Ds. The first is doctrine. Every nuclear state should make an unequivocal no first use declaration. The elders believe that all nuclear armed states should commit to a no first use policy, a formal declaration that they will never use nuclear weapons except in response to a nuclear attack. Any nuclear state that does not feel ready to adopt no first use should at the very least make a declaration that the sole purpose of nuclear weapons is to deter their use by others. We understand that military strategists will always be wary of adopting positions that reduce their flexibility to respond to potential threats. However, the flexibility gained from a first use policy is largely illusory. The threat of first use is simply not credible. The moral cost and the global condemnation that would result from a nuclear attack on a non-nuclear state would exceed any conceivable military benefit. To carry one out against a nuclear adversary would mean mutual national suicide. And yet, by leaving open the possibility of a nuclear first strike, nuclear states force their potential adversaries to prepare for precisely that possibility, reducing trust and increasing the risk of accidental nuclear war. Second, it's our second of the four Ds, D alerting. Almost all warheads should be taken off high alert status, with some 2,000 US and Russian weapons remaining on a dangerously high state of alert, ready to be launched within minutes of receiving information or misinformation about an opponent's attack. The risk remains very high of nuclear <laughs> war being triggered by accidental or unauthorized launches. The prospect of human or system error is an omnipresent reality. The risk compounded by the prospect of cyber sabotage of communication systems. The highest priority must therefore be given to taking as many weapons as possible off their high alert status. And third, deployment. Substantially reduce the one quarter of all nuclear warheads that are currently operationally deployed. Extension of the New START Treaty, which has reduced the number of each side's deployed strategic weapons, is a crucial next step. But the US and Russia should also increase their ambition and start working towards a new agreement that could implement substantially deeper cuts to deployed warhead numbers. So long as nuclear weapons exist, it is probably unavoidable that states will want to retain demonstrably 
survivable retaliatory forces with some weapons kept intact and usable at short notice. But in a world serious about moving to nuclear disarmament, it ought to be possible for the great majority of nuclear weapons to be not only mothballed, but also partially dismantled. And, and finally, our point D4, <laughs> decrease. Dramatically cut the number of nuclear weapons in existence from 14,000 to around 2,000. Such a decrease should be spread evenly between US and Russia, with both reducing to no more than 500 each and no increase in the arsenals of other states. This is in line with a 2010 study by the US Air Force as to the minimum warhead numbers that could constitute an effective US deterrence. Now, successful progress on these measures could also produce positive momentum, creating conditions under which total elimination of nuclear weapons could become a more realistic goal. Of course, the implementation of these measures would be far from a perfect solution. They would not get us to where most of us want to be, which is a nuclear weapons-free world. But they would help to make the world a significantly safer place. The elders believe the challenges of achieving the final elimination of nuclear weapons are daunting and will require a significant amount of political will. But this is not a reason to despair. Small steps can be significant, and what seems unthinkable now is likely to be far more achievable in a decade's time if a minimization agenda like the one we propose develops momentum. As the elders founder, Nelson Mandela, famously said, it always seems impossible until it is done. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Um, thank you both. I, I have one comment and then just two questions, and uh, we'll, we'll turn it to the larger discussion. And, and, and my comment is a way of, of, of reinforcing your central argument about the the value of focusing now on a minimization yeah. uh, agenda, and it and it how I would put it is that you know there's obviously the tension. So there's a there's a moral argument that's reflected in the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons, and, and it's a moral argument that anything more than zero is wrong. It's it's immoral, and and that can be a very powerful argument. But then, as you note in the report, the, the greatest difficulties, the seemingly overwhelming difficulties of verification and enforcement uh, are, are, they grow exponentially as you go from the last 100 or the last 10 weapons to zero. That, that increment mm -hmm. totally changes the verification and, and enforcement requirements. And so I think. And, and, the, and that difficulty yeah. is then used by people who don't want to go anywhere lower yeah. to say, ah, you see, these people are fools, yeah. it's impossible, we can't do it. And so there's that way in which the focus on zero actually keeps, impedes progress mm. towards minimization. Mm. And so I think the, the way you all have articulated mm. that and, and the focus on minimization, um, I, I think is both, in my view, both correct, but I think can be politically useful. So that was the opening comment. So then my questions relate to the four Ds, you know, doctrine, de-alerting, uh, deployment, and decreased numbers. Mm -hmm. And in each of them, it seems the primary focus actually is the U.S. and Russia. In other words, I mean, that's where the, the problems are, especially amongst the bigger nuclear powers. So China has a no first mm -hmm. use doctrine. Mm -hmm. um, India has had one, there's a lot of question about that, but uh, France and the UK don't really say what theirs are. But the US and Russia, their forces are predicated on, mm -hmm. on, on first use. So it really is kind of a US-Russia problem. 
De-alerting similarly, um, clearly the U.S. and Russian forces are, are more on alert than, than others, both in terms of the percentage of those forces. Same with deployment, and then the numbers, as you guys say. Uh, U.S. and Russia have, was it, 92 percent of, mm -hmm. of the art. So, so a couple questions. You know, one, you know, isn't it, if, if it's the case that this really is a U.S.-Russia problem for now, then politically, how do you all look at, at getting traction in Russia and amongst the Russian leadership uh, to pursue this agenda that you're talking about? Because we're having this meeting. Here you'll have a bunch of other meetings in Washington. There are groups that work on these issues. And it's a, it's a different environment in, in Russia. So I'd be curious uh, kind of what your strategy is and what you're encountering and thinking about how to motivate Russian leaders to play along with this. Well, first of all, I'm glad that you um, support the idea of the minimization strategy mm -hmm. for the reasons that you've given and that grew also um, highlighted. Um, yes, it's true that this is primarily addressed, I suppose, to Russia and, uh, China and the US, but it doesn't exclude the others, but, the, but it is primarily. Um, I was very struck, and I think we, we, we discussed it at the time at the Munich Security Conference and since, at the lack of the real back channels, the lack of discussion that's going on, which is really very worrying. And we met um, uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov there, and we tried to encourage more discussion. We, are, we have met President Putin. Um, Gru was at a meeting with Putin with um, five other elders a little while ago. We're looking for a further meeting. We've had a meeting recently in China. We did raise the nuclear issue. So um, we're, we are concerned about the lack of dialogue. Um, and uh, in particular, with the unraveling that's happening, or the unstitching, or however you might describe it. Yeah. Drew, anything on that? Uh, no, uh, the only uh, thing I will add is that, uh, I mean, the, the present uh, complications illustrated by the, even the last few days here in Washington between the US and Russia, they cannot be everlasting. So. I mean, we are making policy uh, positions and, and trying to work on issues that also are, they are short-term important, but also long-term important. So hopefully, a more normal relationship between the US and Russia can uh, re-establish itself, hopefully as soon as possible. <laughs> well, then, then, then let me turn to my second and, and, and last question, because it can build on, on that. Um, you talk in the report about the, the, the need for other states and obviously civil society um, to, uh, to be involved. Obviously, other nuclear weapon states because you want them to contribute to the minimization agenda, but, but there are references to other states including those non-nuclear weapon states who've been relatively uh, active in this space. And so I guess one of the questions is how, how you as, as experienced figures, but also then as an organization, are thinking about um, mobilizing other leaders from other states and, and what, I, what you think they can do to actually motivate U.S. and Russian leaders to em embrace this, this agenda. Do you want to go first on this one? Well, I, I certainly, uh, during the day, we have been asked by people we have been meeting with, where are the leaders that you see <laughs> that could be most accessible and possible to move forward on our agenda? And I have to, I have to admit that, uh, you know, Mary and I were looking at each other, not convinced mm -hmm. that we see so many of them. I mean, you see people in non-nuclear states that could be, uh, but we really need someone <laughs> from a nuclear state to be uh, uh, active in trying to move in this direction. So what we ended up with answering was, well, the closest is probably Macron. I mean, the French position is, uh, at least he's a younger politician, and, and I think, you know, He's one example that I would at least not exclude him from being a, a potential uh, carrier of some messages of wisdom on this area. 
But then, of course, you have a non-nuclear state like Germany. So also Angela Merkel, um, I'm, sh I'm sure, I mean, the two of them. We would be hoping that at least, you know, that they could have some possibility to open up the questions. Because it's, it's been too dead mm -hmm. in many ways for a long time now, the whole nuclear issue. Yeah. Just to build a little on, on what, what Guru was saying, I think what we see this um, policy paper as doing is, is kind of building a bridge between the nuclear powers, none of which have got anywhere near the recent nuclear test ban treaty, um, so that, that has a lot of signatures. And we fear an even wider rift with the NPT review, mm -hmm. you, know, w w you know, a sort of frustration. Um, and uh, you know, th that's, that's a real worry. So, uh, you know, I, I think you're right, we need more dialogue, but we need also to um, build a, a sense of uh, how we engage the nuclear um, powers. And we believe that this minimalist approach is the way to talk and get things moving mm -hmm. and then build towards what we all want, ultimately. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm going to open it up, but I, one of the things that I most await in President Obama's memoir will be, whether it's a chapter on nuclear issues or how, however he treats it, um, but it's exactly this issue. So in 2009, he made the mm -hmm. Prague speech and everybody applauded. Yeah. And then basically no other heads of state, not from the, non, not from the nuclear weapon states, mm -hmm. from the non-nuclear weapon <coughs> states, then kind of worked with him and marched with him and made this a big issue. People just applauded and said, great, so the US wants it to happen, you know, let's move on to other things. And, and you actually need that kind of mobilization that you're, sure. that you're talking about, not just from the weapon state, but from the non-weapon yeah. state. So if, if, if Macron you know, or, mm -hmm. or another were, were to yeah. take that step, then they would need others to buttress them right happen. away. And, and I think that's a real, mm -hmm. uh, it's a real challenge. Um, let's open it up. Uh, you know the drill, you're already raising your hands. When we call on you, then please introduce yourself so the speakers um, know who you are. Uh, Aaron's bringing a mic. Aaron, why don't you start? Uh, oh, and Natalie's there. Why don't you start with the lady right next to you, Aaron, and then we'll come up here. Thank you. Um, my name's Liz Kim. I'm a reporter from Voice of America's Korean Service. Uh, Ms. President and Ms. Prime Minister, I wonder what both of you thought when a recent North Korea's recent uh, short missile range test drew almost none response from the United States. I didn't quite hear. Could you repeat she, she, She's wondering what um, the North Korea's missile test oh, drew yeah. almost yeah. no response from yes. the United States, and yeah. what message do you think that yeah. sends? Well, my understanding is that uh, there's been much, much more concern in Korea and in Japan about that these, and that the, the the sort of apparent lack of concern is really very worrying. I mean, it's, it's 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 clearly trying to politically downplay, but actually these are real. These are missiles which are landing, and it's very serious. The, the, Natalie, right next to you on your left there. Yeah. Thank you both for excellent presentations. Uh, my name is Carlton Stoiber. I'm the director of nuclear security for the International Nuclear Law Association. And the one thing that I did not hear mentioned uh, in this presentation, although it is mentioned briefly in your uh, policy paper on page 11, then there are the risks of non-state terrorist groups yeah. getting their hands on ill-secured nuclear weapons or dangerous nuclear material the breakup of the Soviet Union in 1991 and the scattering of former Soviet nuclear facilities across several fragile newly independent states has led to heightened fears. And so I wonder if you might say a few words about this aspect of the threat, that terrorists or other uh, non-state actors might uh, use the presence of these nuclear weapons uh, arsenals as a basis for very significant terrorism uh, that would have huge implications. Uh, well, I think <laughs> we agree with <laughs> your assessment, and that, that's why it is mentioned. However, given that there is quite a considerable awareness about the question you just raised, and in the context of the two big powers that have nuclear weapons are not moving forward, 
to make agreements um, you know, at the big level of this issue, I think we probably would say that our focus ha has been to try to move <coughs> countries who are now inactive or even skeptical to move together to create more public goods in this area. That that certainly has to be solved if we are going to see a world that is prepared on some reasonable level and, 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 and methods to even address as much as we can the issue you just raised. Because it is really fundamentally a big threat. And if we don't have governments working together across the world on the whole nuclear issue, how are we going to deal with that threat? Uh, we'll work our way to the to the front. Nancy, yeah, uh, and then this gentleman here in the silver suit. So I'm Nancy Gallagher from the University of Maryland, and I think that you've laid out, you know, an eminently sensible set of suggestions for forward progress for those people who support an incremental approach as opposed to immediately saying the goal is zero and that's that. Um, but similar things have been done before. And I'm really interested in your thinking about both what would you be looking for, uh, particularly in the run-up to the 2020 NPT conference and at the 2020 NPT conference, in terms of actual commitments, particularly from the United States and Russia, to start making progress uh, on this agenda. And what types of leverage do you think that non-nuclear weapon states, particularly who are allies of the United States, um, or otherwise in a somewhat ambivalent position about U.S. nuclear policy um, have to bring to bear? Mm. Yeah, I mean, uh, th that is part of our real concern, as I say. We want to try and bridge what is becoming an increasing divide of frustration with the nuclear powers for their failure to implement that important part of the nuclear, uh, the, the NPT. And um, so, uh, you know, I, I, I mean, I, I think um, the review will be very important. The 2015 review was sidelined, as we know, and by a particular issue, and it was an attempt to try and divert that issue. But um, uh, I mean, what we feel is it, it's connected. I mean, if we if we if we don't have dialogue at the serious nuclear issue on these issues, and and um, agreements are beginning to unravel, it doesn't. Um, bode well for the, for the review of the um, NPT. Um, certainly, you know, we would be supportive of um, the, you know, the large number of groups and Carnegie and others who are you know, uh, attempting to make sure that we have a better climate for that review. But uh, um, I, I do believe that um, uh, non-nuclear states obviously have a, role, a strong role to play, but they're getting increasingly frustrated because They've gone the step further, and no nuclear country has, um, has, has in any way approached or bridged with them. You know? So there is a divide growing in this area as in others, um, which, is, which, is, which, is kind of re which is regrettable. You know, I will add to this that, that when um, the nuclear ban treaty uh, was also awarded the Nobel Peace Prize, a lot of difficult attention happened in, uh, certainly in Oslo, uh, where the prize was being given by the Nobel Committee about, and we were all wondering, what is our prime minister going to say now? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and, but also generally in other NATO countries, of course. So uh, one important issue is part of your question, I think, is how, how do we open up some nuanced dialogue on these issues, given that, of course, in many NATO countries, and certainly in Norway, uh, there's a lot of skepticism about the present situation. And that doesn't mean that Norway has signed up to the nuclear ban treaty because all the NATO countries decided not to do so. It doesn't mean that there isn't a lot of attention and interest, you know, supporting the long-term goal of that treaty. So to open up for a discussion at a more reasonable level 
which can speak even to the nuclear powers, and including our own allies, is an important aspect, I think, of what we may be able to contribute to by this report that we, are, we have made. Um, this gentleman right here with a silver suit. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Akbar. I'm a former World Bank official. First, a note of thank you to distinguished ladies uh, for their uh, distinguished career and excellent uh, proposal uh, along with other elders. Uh, my question is on your proposal on these four Ds on the timing. Uh, is there a sequence? Uh, when do you expect to accomplish these four Ds, uh, or even getting closer to those targets. Uh, my second question is that two countries, Pakistan and India, recently showing jaws on the issue of Kashmir, uh, although both are signatories of non-proliferation, is there any way that elders could reach both countries to <laughs> cool down <laughs> on Kashmir? Thank you. Well, maybe I'll take the easy first question now. <laughs> <laughs> um, but on the, on the 40s, I mean, we, we launched this report at the Munich Security Conference. We took it with us to China, talked to China, very engaged with it. We, we talked with other, indeed, with the foreign minister of uh, Iran during the um, UNGA um, a couple of days ago. Ban Ki-moon and myself met with him. Um, we are very keen to, um, you know, sort of uh, open up um, a, a very lively debate, partly because of the review next year, because of the need to um, energize a new start and, and all of that. Um, so we're not, not doing a special timing. It's just we feel what we will, we've been asked to participate and indeed launch the doomsday clock in January. We will use our, you know, powers of advocacy to try to, um, uh, you know, alert the world to how serious the situation is and that we need to make um, progress and that this minimalization agenda is the minimum progress that we need to make, if you like, and we need to make it quickly um, because uh, we're, we're actually going backwards and we are facing, as we've said, a nuclear arms race, which is really very serious. Well, Mary, if you think <laughs> I can <laughs> decide our priorities and our travel agendas, whether we can do you know, something serious between Pakistan and India. Yeah, but I, I'm, you know, when we try to uh, uh, direct our own work, our preparation, our, our policy development, and our decisions about where to focus and where we should spend our time, uh, uh, we always think, w is this an area of wh which is not being dealt with in a serious way or sufficiently already? Then maybe we should look. And also, do we think? that an independent group like ours could make a difference to what is otherwise being done by others. We are always looking at the efficiency because we are, after all, a small group with a small secretariat. So, you know, this is the kind of, uh, of, of thinking that goes behind our decision. Uh, we don't have a plan at the moment to go to India and Pakistan. But, but I have to tell you, we, we have gone to India and tried to meet with President Modi, but also because we are pushing universal health coverage. Because a country like India, with its large population, has a really uh, not sufficient system <laughs> of health coverage for its people. So, you know, there are several issues that, which lead us to want to speak with certain leaders that could make a difference. But we didn't, we met others uh, of the Indian government, but we didn't get access to President Modi, uh, uh, to Prime Minister Modi. So, so, you know, it's also a question, where do you get access? And we have gone, as you have, you have been to Iran, we have been to China, we have been to Russia, at the highest level. And by the way, we haven't been to the highest level here. <laughs> not even, <laughs> not even before Trump. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. But they have bilaterals uh, day and night, so I'm sure. So it's not as easy. But we would do it if we thought we could really make a difference. Yeah. 
this gentleman here now. Good afternoon, and thank you for being here, and uh, welcome to the United States. My name is Julian Kyle Lewis from the American University here in Washington. Um, following our most recent United States presidential election in 2016, uh, the Women's March here in Washington was the largest uh, mass demonstration in the history of this country. In the entire history, it was the biggest. So uh, my question for you is, um, a lot of young girls really grow up thinking, you know, that this is a man's world, and as high as you make it in your uh, career trajectory, that there's always some, some guy or some group of guys telling you what you can do, what you can't do, what you can and can't say. And even if you're the president of Ireland or the prime minister of Norway, there are still young people who don't respect that title as much as they should to, to feel that you have a voice of significance on a global scale on a very uh, pertinent issue like nuclear policy. So can you talk about uh, how you were as young girls that grew you up today to become who you are and what you represent? <laughs> Thank you very much. That's actually more interesting than nuclear policy, so I'm glad, <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm glad he asked. Please, please. <laughs> well, I think I could begin and say that uh, I um, grew up in the west of Ireland, not in a political family. My, both my parents were medical doctors, as it happens. But I had four brothers, two older than me and two younger than me. And that was a good preparation for <laughs> asserting myself and <laughs> using my elbows, etc. But, you know, I felt, always felt very lucky in my life in many ways um, to... Uh, uh, I came to the Harvard Law School after graduating in law from, uh, from uh, Dublin University Trinity College. And it was... A, a very special year, 1967 to 68, so that's why I'm an elder. And um, it was the year where the young um, American contemporaries were disputing an immoral war. Martin Luther King was assassinated mm -hmm. in April. Just after I graduated, Robert Kennedy was assassinated. And what I remember from that year, and it stood with me um, in the future, was that young people were actually taking action. They were going into civil rights programs. They were going into poverty programs in the south of this country. They were talking about giving a leadership. Whereas in Ireland that I had come from, you waited your turn, and your turn didn't come until you were in your, in your 40s or something. So I stood for election the following year to the Irish Senate and got elected at the age of 25, wow. and then just sort of went on from there. Uh, you know. But it, you're never, you never do it on your own. You do it with a, a whole lot of other people. <laughs> I learned more about Mary now than <laughs> on, on, <laughs> on, that, on uh, that part of Mary's life. Well, you know, <laughs> I was the oldest in my fa of the children in my family, and I think my parents, uh, they were both social democrats, young idealists when they had their children. In, in, in Norway, where the labor movement was strong, and the Labour Party was very was strong, uh, so I grew up in a political family, not like uh, Mary. But my father happened to be a doctor too, uh, <laughs> but a politician. So then uh, I chose to be a medical doctor, and strangely, I went to Harvard like Mary. I went to the Harvard School of Public Health when I was 25, or 24, 25, one year, an important year, just a few years ahead of of Mary, and I then got exposed to occupational health, pollution, a number, traffic congestion, a number of things that were already widespread in the US, but were not problems in Norway at that time. So for 10 years after my time at Harvard, I knew what was coming, and I was engaging more and more in the public health arena uh, and uh, on pollution and other issues that I had seen, I knew they were coming. So when I was asked to become prime, you know, uh, environment minister, all of a sudden, which was uh, unusual, I was 35, and one day I was called <coughs> to the prime minister's office, will you please enter the government? I had not campaigned, I had not, like Mary, gone into an election circle, but they saw there was this young woman uh, belonging to the Social Democratic Party that was active 
in public health issues. And so from then, from that day, uh, being placed at the cabinet table and leading a ministry, I have been on my way to do what I can. Uh, but like Mary, you know, we, we chose to stay on, on this, uh, not only in Norway or Ireland, but certainly these are global issues and global concerns which is why we are now... So, so you became the mother of sustainable development. Mother I of... I love to call yeah. you that. Oh, right. Right. <laughs> right. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Uh, let the lady right there, right... Yes. Thanks, Natalie. And then there's a gentleman here in the gray coat, and we'll work our way front and then back. Hi, uh, I'm Emily Newton from the British Embassy. Wow, how do I follow that question? Um, Bringing it back to nuclear, um, with the advent of climate change and the realization and the need for higher and higher energy demands, how do we allow for people to use nuclear power, atoms for peace? How do we make it so that new states that want to use that new technology are able to do so without the potential for them to make nuclear weapons. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's a very interesting question. And obviously, nuclear energy doesn't um, add to the problem of the emissions. But uh, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not very hardline on this. But from everything I've heard, first of all, it's extremely expensive. Secondly, there are risks. And also, um, at the end of the time of the plant, it's extremely expensive to demolish. Um, and there are some risks involved. And we saw even risks from climate nature itself in recently in Japan, you know, a terrible um, problem. So given that solar and wind and other renewable energy is becoming cheaper and cheaper, it does seem that it's a better way forward um, to go for the other renewable energy. Um, uh, you know, I, I mean, and certainly I don't think that um, Saudi Arabia needs nuclear um, energy. Um, at the moment. Um, I, I was part of KAUST, the King Abdullah University for Science and Technology, for a number of years. So, um, Saudi Arabia at that time realized it had extremely good potential for solar. It had great sun mm. right in the middle, and it also had good sand. I think, and it was doing high-level research, buying in knowledge from the United States in particular everywhere. And I now see they're going solar. They have no need for nuclear, except, except perhaps a more dangerous need. And that's, that, that, that's very worrying. Uh, let's, let, what I'm going to do, we're running out of time. So if you can bring the microphone, and we'll go around this table. I'm, 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 I'm favoring young people for the reason <laughs> that I mentioned with the elders. So we like that. ask the three questions in a row, and then at least we'll have them on the table. And okay. you guys do what you can. Please. Yeah. Thank you so much. And thank you very much for your presentations. They're very inspiring. So uh, my name is Angel, and I'm with Phoenix TV. Um, my question is, I also used to work in the United Nations. And one of the questions that I have is, like, we, all, we can always encourage, we can always advocate. But it's always hard to finally lead to the enforcement of, like, uh, all these kind of actions. Like, how do you think we can finally lead to the state of the enforcement of the decreasing in nuclear weapons. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And then this gentleman and the woman next to you, and then, and then yours. Thank you. That was good. Uh, hi, Chase Enright, a recent graduate of the uh, Corbell School at the University of Denver. Uh, so my question is primarily about nuclear weapons modernization and whether that fits into your um, 4D proposals. Um, I know that's a current issue of contention with the MPT, but would that uh, modernization while decreasing the physical number comply with your overall goals, or would that be counter uh, to the ideas uh, you've put forward. Hi, um, thank you for coming. My name is Juliet. I'm from the U.S. Helsinki Commission. And my question is more so about um, how tactical nuclear weapons play a role in your policy proposal. Um, these weapons are designed for battle rather than global destruction and even kind of push this idea that limited nuclear war is possible. And so I was wondering how because your proposal is very focused, it seems to me anyways, is focused on nuclear weapons that are meant for global catastrophe, how it also proposes to handle nuclear weapons that are meant to be used on a limited scale. Okay. All right, three good questions. 
Maybe if you take the first one and I'll take the second and third because I think they're very linked. Well, the, the, uh, yeah, I mean, it was how do you, uh, you, you can encourage and you can advocate and you can recommend uh, working in the multilateral system, working in the UN in different parts, but the enforcement part is always a frustration because we don't have an enfor in most areas we don't have an enforcement mechanism. The only places we have that is where you have an agreement which is in, 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 uh, enforced, I mean, which is already agreed to, ratified, etc., as an inst international instrument. Then you can have verification procedures, you can have control mechanisms, uh, you can have a kind of accountability. And this is what we, we need to be pushing for in more areas. Uh, because unless we have accountability uh, from leaders of countries, uh, then yes, you can advocate and you can inspire, but we need also more of a global governance system, which is developed by countries agreeing to a number of things. And, and, and during my lifetime, I have, after all, seen movements in good directions in this, although in my own, own opinion, it's not strong enough, and we are far from it with regard to the nuclear issue, for instance. But th there is a way, and we have to be pushing on. Yeah, I, I may be wrong, but I, I felt that the question about the um, nuclear weapons modernization and the question of tactical nuclear weapons was really talking about these low-yield weapons, um, which we don't believe are at all um, an advance um, because any use of nuclear weapons is um, you know, horrific. And these low yield are not low yield, they are nuclear weapons um, from what I understand. So um, we would hope that this would not be considered to be part of a modernization in quotes um, process. Um, I hope that answers um, the question, but we, we, we um, uh, we understand that this is something that's being discussed at the moment in Congress, and we're, we're, we're quite concerned about it. I, I just, uh, yeah. I'll, I'll close by just on both yeah. of those yeah. questions. Yeah. I mean, it seems to me that, that, that one of the additional reasons why focusing practical energy now on minimization is useful is that you don't have to resolve those, two, those yeah. two issues. So, for example, if somebody, you know, French presidents have before said, well, we might, if we have nuclear weapons, we might just use as a demonstration shot if we were losing a major aggression. And so you don't have to resolve that issue about that you were talking about if it's not a totally catastrophic uh, action when you're debating about minimization. Whereas when you're debating about zero, then that yep. comes up. And similarly yeah. with modernization, mm -hmm. as long as you're going down, then if they're switching systems, yeah. it's mm -hmm. less of a, 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 a yeah. stumbling uh, yeah. obstacle. Anyway, thank you. Those were great questions. So thanks, awesome. everybody, for yeah. coming. And then please join me uh, in thanking uh, Prime Minister Bruin and President Robbins. Thank you very much. Thank you.